Happy Friday, and welcome back to Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Unanswered questions. That's what a family has been saddled with for seven years at this point, and not just unanswered questions, but a ton of grief to go along with it. A 20-year-old was reportedly house-sitting for a friend. Was there a knock at the door? Did someone demand money? Did someone demand drugs? Was there even any conversation at all? Questions left for the family of Blake Cruz. And what about help? What about coverage? Thankfully, a few local media sources reported on this case heavily while it was happening into the following years, about three years after, and then the coverage just trailed off, just completely stopped. I think it's time that we help re-raise the coverage, get people talking and thinking about this case again, and maybe, maybe getting that critical tip that this family has been waiting for called in. Let's take a look at this case together. This is Blake Cruz. You can tell from this picture, we're talking a, a very young man here, about 20 years old. Where is this happening? In Henderson, Kentucky. Henderson is along the Ohio River and is the county seat of Henderson County, Kentucky. Population was just over 28,000 at the 2010 U.S. Census. It's part of the Evansville metropolitan area, locally known as the tri-state area. Let's go ahead and jump to Google Earth, zero in on Kentucky, and here we find Henderson. Of course, there is the river that we mentioned. You can see it running on the north and the west side of Henderson. And if you look at pictures of Henderson, quite honestly, it looks like parts of it, like Main Street Anywhere USA. And they literally do have a Main Street. This is North Main Street that we're looking at here. We can see plenty of history, historical buildings. Obviously, it looks like a beautiful day uh, when this Google car came through and shot this footage. But just outside of where that main street area is, we find the block of 500 Fairmont Avenue. Now, thankfully, the uh, Kentucky State Police have released a video about this case. Let's hear just a little bit from them about how they came to learn about this, what happened when they rolled up on the scene. Our agency responded to a burglary in progress call in the 500 block of Fairmont Avenue in Henderson, Kentucky. When responding troopers arrived, they noticed the front door open to the residence, but inside was the body of 20-year-old Blake Cruz. Blake had been shot multiple times, yet no one else was located inside the residence. Let's get into the articles on this case. I want to give a big thank you to 14news.com because they reported on this case very regularly, very consistently. For some reason, it stops around 2018. Um, but let's go ahead and get into the details here, starting with an article from January 17th, 2015. It's a quote from Sergeant Russell Roberts. In Henderson, we don't have a lot of violent crimes like this. So to have something like this in this neighborhood or any other area, it's usually a pretty calm, quiet county, and it's very unusual. Police wound up going door to door asking people what they knew about the people who lived at the home and also asking if they heard any type of commotion. Uh, Sergeant Roberts says this is going to be one of those where we depend on the community's help to solve this murder. And looking back at it now, seven years away from this instance, I think that's still the key for this case. I think this family and law enforcement are still waiting for the person that has the information to step forward. Why isn't that person talking? They might be afraid because of some of the elements going on around this case, but uh, let's continue. Neighbors say they aren't sure who lives in the house, but do see a lot of people come and go. One neighbor says she lived in this neighborhood for 40 years. She often hears car doors slam and parties going on at the house, but never thought it would turn violent. So obviously one of the concerns we have is that this house, if there's parties going on all the, all the time there, there could be drugs around this house. More than that, you have a neighbor talking about cars coming and going. She's hearing the door slamming all the time. Is there a possibility someone living in this house is dealing as well? If that's the case, all of a sudden the risk factor goes up 
exponentially. Now, I've been looking into the available social information I can find on Blake. I'm not seeing anything that points to him necessarily being a part of some deep, dark drug culture. Uh, and I don't know that this is something like, wow, these guys kind of sold some marijuana out of their house and, you know, someone came and shot the person at the house. I, I'm having trouble kind of lining all that up, but what I'm feeling is, uh, Blake doesn't even have to know how that house is used. If it is used for deals like that, maybe it's a place where he went to a party every now and then. I don't, I don't know. We have no real insight into that. Honestly, the owners of the home might want someone house sitting it because they have a lot of merchandise or they have a lot of money in there. But Blake doesn't necessarily have to be a party. Like he doesn't have to be aware of that. Uh, on the rumor tip, I'm hearing that maybe there was something like that in the house, but, uh, and we're going to see law enforcement's pretty straightforward. They do think there was some type of, of drug component. Um, but I'm telling you once again, that's not something that Blake needs to necessarily be aware of. And, you know, I've, I've gone through this guy's Twitter feed. I'm not getting the sense that this is someone that's really in that type of deep, you know, drug community where, someone's going to come looking for money. Someone's going to come looking for drugs. Someone's going to come to get a debt repaid, something like that. This, he seems like just a pretty straightforward, straight up kid. He's a college student. Uh, he's, he's into music. He's, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with, because even there's, there's a podcast that was done on this um i haven't been familiar with it. it's true crime cast uh the hosts i thought did a pretty good job with it they interviewed some people but even their perception is kind of like well you can tell it's a drug house you know just because of of how it looks honestly i'm not seeing that like i don't i don't know what the identifying marks are uh for a drug house the information that the neighbor is putting out there um sure cars coming and going parties happening there all the time um but, you know, that could be a, a frat house as well. You might hear a similar description. So I'm just trying to tread cautiously with this information. Law enforcement, definitely pretty strong on thinking that there's a drug component that's a part of this. Back to a quote from Trooper Corey King. I don't know if the homeowner was targeted or not. This is someone who was sitting at the home for them while the owners were gone. At this point, we don't know if a burglary was actually part of it or if this was the intended purpose to burglarize a residence. So even at this point, he's thinking someone came here to get something um, or someone targeted the homeowner and got it wrong. Is that really a possibility? We'll look at some photos and, and see what you guys think about that. On to another article published January 18th. An autopsy was completed Sunday in Louisville for a murder victim in Henderson County. Kentucky State Police say 20-year-old Blake G. Cruz of Henderson died of multiple gunshot wounds to the face. There hasn't been a official release on what type of weapon was used. I can tell you the podcast. Um, they quoted information that they say came from the family, and it sounds like there's a possibility that it was a shotgun. But we have to take that information with a huge grain of salt. Once again, that's coming through a podcast. They're saying based on a conversation they had with family, none of that is official record. And from what I can see, that's been put out through the media. No details of the weapon have been disclosed. Another thing, no details of Blake's body's location have been disclosed. Is this something that happened in the front doorway? Is this something that happened in the rear bedroom, in a bathroom? Like just none of those types of details that might give you some insight into what happened. Like, was he comfortable enough with the person to actually let them in the home? You know, was there signs of a struggle inside the home? Was there other things? Did the, the place look ransacked? I mean, if we're thinking about this situation that someone was going there because they wanted to steal money or drugs or anything else, did it look like that to police? Based on the comments we're hearing, especially the theory here that they, well, he's saying they don't know if burglary was actually a part of it. Um, I just feel like it would be pretty obvious to them if they went in and especially if someone's looking for a hidden stash. Like, you know, if, if there are drugs being dealt from this house, there's a good chance there's going to be some type of closet or, you know, part of the garage, something like that, where that type of stuff is being stored. Um, was that type of, you know, searching done? 
Once again, we have no details. Other details very scarce in this coverage, and I'm not trying to knock 14 News. I thought they did a, a really good job here, but that's about the humanity of Blake. Who is Blake as a person? Um, let's go ahead and take a look at RudyRowland.com. This is the funeral home. And here we can see the, the profile for Blake Graydon Cruz. Died January 16th, 2015. Born April 23rd, 1994. It just it boggles my mind how young he is. He attended Kentucky Wesleyan College and Henderson Community College, where he majored in business. He was especially involved with Sigma Nu Fraternity and was a proud member of Kentucky Wesleyan Band. Within the fraternity, he was elected as Sentinel and he devoted countless hours to community service. A musician and gifted drummer, Blake also played in Henderson County High School Marching Band, Winter Drumline, and several other bands with his friends. He participated in mission trips, youth groups, and was a state bowling champion. His favorite place was Seattle, where he dreamed of living. Uh, what I understand is one of his dreams was also that he wanted to teach drumming. He wanted to pass that on to, to other people, help them become good drummers. And as a matter of fact, I do see a message in his Twitter where he's talking about the first day of him teaching and how much it meant to him and the fact that he could probably make a lot of money at it. He doesn't say drums in particular. I think there's probably a pretty good chance that it was a drum lesson. Blake was authentic and passionate about his dreams and his future. He loved his family and friends, and he never met a stranger. He was charismatic, fun-loving, independent thinker. He marched to the beat of his own drum. That's a little bit of insight on Blake. Uh, this is the Facebook page for his fraternity. I guess they did something very sweet in terms of digitally adding him to a photo uh, with the rest of his frat brothers for their graduation. But how about we hear a little bit from the people that knew him best, his family. Uh, he loved nature and he loved, loved to be outdoors. He loved to be in this park playing frisbee with his friends. Well, Blake was um, adventuresome. He would walk in a room and he would just light up a room. A huge loss, huge. We miss him so much. Life's not the same. That was Blake's mother and father. He is also brother to two sisters. He's got multiple cousins, nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, just so many people that are waiting for the word that, hey, justice is finally coming in this case. And they've been waiting seven years at this point. Let's continue with the coverage here from 14 News. This one from February 4th, 2015. Arrests made in Henderson murder investigation fairly quick. We're talking within a few weeks and we've got multiple arrests. What's going on with this? Uh, let's start with the pictures. This is the first person that was arrested. His name is Jacob McLaughlin, 21 years old. Uh, the next person is Andrew Jacko, 24 years old. Uh, we've got Sean Barnett, 20 years old. And then we've got Corey Peterson, 25 years old. Kentucky State Police have arrested four men on charges relating to the murder investigation of Blake Cruz. 24-year-old Andrew Jacko is charged with failure to report a death and possession of drug paraphernalia. 25-year-old Corey L. Peterson is charged with failure to report a death and possession of marijuana and drug paraphernalia. 21-year-old Jacob McLaughlin is charged with possession of synthetic drugs and drug paraphernalia. And 20-year-old Sean Barnett is charged with failure to report a death. When I first started looking into this case and I started bumping into articles that were phrased like this, it made it sound to me like I felt like there was a house party or something going on there when the shooting happened and then all these guys just scattered and then law enforcement went and picked them up. Now, I don't think that's the case. And I think it's pretty clear from the early comments, they think Blake was at home alone and they might have some direct information for that. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that as we continue here. So just know if you guys are feeling like that, I felt the exact same way, but I don't think that's what happened. I do think these guys all went back to the scene after the shooting and then they left, but I don't think they were there actually for it. Uh, Kentucky State Police Trooper Corey King says they don't have enough evidence to charge anyone with murder yet, but police are still investigating and have arrest warrants out for other suspects. Police believe three of the men arrested today, Jacko, Peterson, and Barnett actually walked around Cruz while he was dead on the floor, 
and didn't call for help. Investigators believe this is all part of a bigger picture, what King is calling a drug culture. Um, so once again, if, if King is right, and this is some type of drug culture that is wrapped up around this house, do we have a situation where these guys go back, they see what's happened, and they are now in fear of their own life? And that's why they're not calling police. They're trying to just flee the scene and not be part of any of this. Uh, what's interesting is you'll hear some of the investigators that are talking about this case, and they'll refer to these people as his so-called friends because they're, they're making a good point. What type of real friends would do this? Go back and see your body lying on a ground and not call police or not call emergency services? Um, so it does occur to me that there's probably some type of strong fear factor that's going on here. And if there is, is this drug culture aspect quite a bit more serious than maybe we originally, or even Blake originally understood? 14news.com, two more arrests in connection with Henderson County murder investigation. This one from the next day, February 5th. We've got this man, Dominic Dixon, uh, 22 years old. And then we've got Garrett Eblin, 25 years old. I do believe uh, Garrett is one of the owners along with his brother, James. Uh, that's information, once again, coming from the podcast. I just want to thank them for their additional research. True Crime Cast, thank you guys for helping to make it a bit more of a complete picture. Um, Thursday, 25-year-old Garrett Eblin of Henderson and 22-year-old Dominic Dixon of Henderson were both charged with failure to report a death. So once again, it seems like they were part of that same crowd. I don't know if these guys are all traveling together. Like, do they arrive there at the same time? How much time is going on here? Like between the shooting and someone actually calling this in. Troopers say that Cruz was house-sitting for Eblin. Wednesday, four people were arrested that that's the from the article before all four of those people bonded out of jail so literally they're in jail less than a day we get another update from february 13th about two more henderson men being arrested james l eblin so this is the brother uh 20 years old and jonathan pool 27 both of henderson turned themselves into authorities pool was charged with failure to report the death of a person. Eblin was charged with trafficking marijuana, less than eight ounces, possession of marijuana, and possession of drug paraphernalia. They are the seventh and eighth men charged in connection with the Cruz case. So you would think that, wow, this sounds like real progress. Like, hey, we've got all these arrests happening. They've got all these people they can interview. They're probably collecting a bunch of information. Why isn't this thing solved at this point? First thing I'm wondering is, do these guys really know what happened there? Uh, if these guys are all coming back to the house after the fact, calling each other up, oh my God, you have to come here, Blake's been shot. Um, and then trying to figure out what to do next. Hey, police are going to think we're part of this. We can't be any part of this. All right, then let's just all split. There's, there's really a, a possibility that they don't have a whole lot to offer the investigation. There's also a possibility that they know exactly what happened and for some reason they're they're scared to talk. Maybe just seeing what happened to Blake is enough to keep them all quiet. It's seven years at this point and I'm hoping that maybe things have changed. Maybe they've grown out of being part of this type of culture. Um, maybe some of them have families now, can understand what it would feel like to lose a, a, a loved one, especially a child. That's what I'm hoping for is just at the right time. And that's why we got to keep exposure going on this case. Uh, at the right time, that message is going to reach the person that has the right information. And they're going to decide now, now is the time to do the right thing. The thing that I should have done seven years ago. And they're going to pick up that phone. Of course, if now is the time, we've got all the contact information that you need in the description box down below. And uh, man, I, I do hope, I hope now is the time for this family. Uh, let's continue another article from 14news.com. The parents of a Henderson murder victim are pleading with the public for information on who killed their son. This is from March 2015. Greg and Donna Cruz, parents of Blake, want to know why a person took their son's life. Law enforcement tells us Blake Cruz was just in the wrong place at the wrong time when he was senselessly killed back in January. Blake's parents say he was never in trouble. 
just a college kid house sitting for a friend. So information coming here, um, I think this is just leaning back to that theory of whoever came to the house with that gun wasn't necessarily looking for Blake. If they weren't looking for Blake, they were probably looking for the Eblen brothers. Uh, now we did see a photo of one of them, this one, but even just looking at Garrett, I mean, could you possibly, if you had interacted with this guy, not so often, could you confuse him? with Blake. I think it's a possibility. Throw on a, a baseball cap or something like that. It, it becomes even more of a possibility. Pair of sunglasses, you know, it'd be really, really tough to tell the difference. Uh, obviously, at the time that uh, Garrett is brought in, he's got a pretty full beard. Who knows? And who knows the, the mental state of the person that came and did this? Who knows if they were clean? Or, or what their perception was like at the, at the time. There's just, there's a lot of different factors here, but I do think it makes sense why law enforcement is putting this theory out a little bit, just of, hey, we don't really, we, we don't think Blake was necessarily the intended victim. I think that's also a comment about their research in terms of what they're finding out about Blake. Uh, because I think it'd be pretty clear if this guy was steeped in, you know, gangster drug culture, it was just something that he was emulating. I'm just, I'm, I'm not seeing it. And you guys know, I mean, I, I look into these cases a lot. I look into people's social media a lot. There's times where I do see indicators of, hey, look, they're kind of, you know, glorifying or emulating uh, gangster drug culture, but I still don't think that they're involved in something like that. You know, just because you like certain brands, certain logos, certain music doesn't mean that all of a sudden, you know, you can just make that straight assumption anyway. And even if you do, do we write them off? This family is hurting just as much as any other family would. No, we don't write them off. So his family gets on candlelight vigils. They hold several vigils actually just in the first year. Uh, April 24th, 2015, a candlelight vigil is held on what would be Blake's 21st birthday. Henderson Mayor Steve Austin signed a proclamation declaring April 23rd Blake Cruz Day. Blake's sister, Amanda Miller, says now the family is just wishing for peace healing hopefully and justice we want to heal and we want to be able to just take it day by day says miller on 14 news we see that of the eight arrests that happen two of the men actually plead guilty two of the eight people arrested in connection with the murder investigation in henderson have pleaded guilty andrew jacko and sean barnett were both charged with failure to report the death of a person uh, I believe the brothers might also have done an Alfred plea. Uh, you can listen to more details about that over on Crimecast. And if you don't know what an Alfred plea is, it's essentially just, uh, it's not an admission of guilt, but they know that the evidence is stacked against them. So it's almost, it's kind of like a no contest, but um, there's there's basically a, a ruling that can still happen, a sentencing that can still happen with an Alfred plea. But here we've got to actually pleading guilty. That happens in August of 2015. And just a few days later, we get some comments from Blake's mother, Donna. The crime is still very much unsolved and it's still very much being investigated. We're appealing to the community so that the people responsible can be caught and this gets resolved. I'm trying to keep Blake's name out there so it's on everybody's mind. So someone will have the heart to call in something which will lead police down the right path. This is also about crime prevention because we don't want this to happen to anyone else. And you heard it from the re responding sergeant on the scene. This doesn't happen out here. Like they're, they're just not used to this. Uh, unfortunately, they do have a second case that kind of happens here as well. Let's learn about it over at 14 News. It was a night to pay tribute. Families of murder victims prayed, sang, and lit candles on Homicide Victims Awareness Day. The two families who spoke were Shane Breedloves and Blake Cruises. Breedlove was shot and killed in July on his way to work on Evansville's east side. Both families say the loss had been devastating and they want justice. Friday gave them a chance to reflect, to remember Breedlove, Cruz, and all homicide victims, and to thank the community. Here it notes three men are facing charges in Breedlove's death, and of course, that no one has been arrested specifically for Cruz's murder. 
Uh, I did just take a quick look and those three men facing the charges wind up being let go. And actually the family is still looking for justice in Shane Breedlove's case as well. Over at tristatehomepage.com, of course we have the holidays come around. It's an extremely hard time of the year for the Cruz family. This Christmas was much different, Blake's mother said. It was hard to find the joy that you're supposed to have. Blake Cruz's mother says her son brought light to so many. Now here is a different detail. I'm not seeing it in a lot of places, so we're going to take it with a, a little grain of salt, but it's saying here that state police says Cruz called the homeowner saying someone was trying to break in. Police say the homeowner then called 911. This information kind of throws the timeline off a little bit for me. Obviously, it seems that they're saying Blake called one of the Eblin brothers, we don't know which one, and says, hey, someone's trying to break into the house. Um, then, for some reason, Eblin calls 911. First of all, it's just a little weird to me because let's say that you're, you're house sitting, right? Someone is coming in through a window, breaking through a window, scratching at the door, something. You, why don't you call 911 yourself? What's what's happening with that? It kind of makes me question a little bit the information coming from Eblin, that that's the trigger for 911, especially makes, and at a, once again, I don't know which Eblin, but it especially makes me question the possibility that Eblin and all his boys go back they're able to get to the house before police response. They're walking around the body enough that I think they actually must have left tracks or something because somehow these guys just start falling like dominoes in terms of being arrested. Or maybe police were able to identify the first few and through that they got the names of the other. There's something that hoops in this big party of eight. But in terms of the timeline, if this is accurate, and they're saying that this is coming from the state police, they're saying Cruz called the homeowner, one of the homeowners, and they're the ones that called 911. Something about that is really broken and off because it doesn't give them time for them and their boys to go back to the house, see what happened, pontificate about it, flee, and then what? Then finally, emergency response shows up. Something's wrong with the timing around all that. Um, does that put one of those eight back in consideration for me? I don't, I don't have enough details to really stack these things one way or the other. I'm just telling you in time, in terms of looking at this from the outside with the available information, putting a little timeline together in order of events, something is broken with this particular information coming out. I'm just, I'm having trouble getting my head around it. If you've got some ideas, please tell me about it in the comments down below. KSP says up to eight people were arrested in connection with the case. That's the thing that's weird. You're putting several of these guys at the scene. There's something that they were able to do from the scene to track these guys down and to get convictions and pleas, uh, you know, at least the Alford pleas in a couple of cases to the charges specifically that they, they didn't call, um, that they, they left, they left the body without calling emergency services. So you've got them at the scene somehow. This time frame, I don't understand. With dreams of teaching drum lessons and getting a degree in business, this 20-year-old had a life ahead of him. Now, his family can only see him through pictures, but the memories of Blake keep them going. Once again, thank you, 14 News. Such good coverage on this. Please pick it back up. Uh, I know COVID hit through a lot of uh, smaller news organizations into a tizzy. Some of them didn't last. I totally understand. Uh, but 14 News, if you're still around, please, please pick this back up. Saturday marks the one-year anniversary of a gruesome murder in Henderson. No one was ever charged with the murder. Of course, this is an article from January 15th, 2016. Trooper Corey King with the Kentucky State Police says detectives have a lot of tangible evidence but they need a witness testimony. King says someone has to know something and they have a $15,000 reward in the case. I believe 
that's still available. Uh, it's hard to tell for sure with how these articles are dated, but uh, some of that money I think came from Crime Stoppers. There was an initial reward that came out. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the state police contributed to that. I think the family also contributed directly to that. So that reward should still be standing. And here at Tri-State homepage, there is an interview with Blake's parents uh, at the three-year mark. And it's just, it's just heartbreaking. It's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. You could see the, the pain on their faces. It's, it's like they've literally just been told what happened the day before. And from their point of view, it's almost like that. It's almost like being stuck in Groundhog Day. Like you're just, you're living each day with that same pain, the same realization. Every morning you open your eyes and that realization has to hit over and over and over and over. It's been doing that to these people for seven years help them shift that to a different place wouldn't it be great if they could open their eyes that realization hits and then they have the next realization of oh but thankfully the person that did this isn't on the streets anymore thankfully the person that did this faced responsibility had had justice enacted maybe even stepped up and did the right thing and turned themselves in can you imagine what that would do for these people and other family members that they're not in the press. This, these, there's so many people that are affected. Uh, I learned about this case from someone that knew Blake. And because of the elements of this case, I don't wanna go much more into that, but I'm just telling you the ripple effect of how many people are affected by a loss like this and what it still means to them. Th this person contacted me just within the, the past few weeks. So it's, it's not just, you know, hey, we could forget about two parents living in misery. Which, first of all, if you could, man, check your heart. But there's a lot of people still feeling the grief, still feeling the pain, and still feeling the loss of Blake. Um, at the Gleaner, Kentucky State Police Detective Mark Carter told the Gleaner, we are still fielding new information and new leads almost weekly. Now this is back at the three year mark in 2018. I don't know what that is currently. Here we have a picture of a much different Christmas than I'm sure this family has seen since uh, this picture, which was in 2014. Uh, we have the parents with Blake in the photo. Uh, we have a quote here about something special that happens in this as well. Blake's fraternity, Sigma Nu, included Blake in their composite picture for graduation, said his mother, Donna. They presented us with this beautifully framed picture with Blake in it. They were so sweet. I wanted to do something for them in return, so I bought a tree. The fraternity and our family will plant the tree. We have a plaque, and the fraternity has decided to inscribe their motto on the plaque. The fraternity's motto is love honor and truth man what that couldn't do for this case i wanted the tree to be along the river walk because blake loved the park and the river walk uh, his father says it was kind of something they would do like on the weekends the family would go to the park together and just blake really loved being out there so they thought that was the right spot for the tree we're going to put ribbons on it so people know that it's Blake's tree and that his case isn't solved. The, they also talk about the fact they want to expand it as to more of a memorial for homicide victims in general as the years go on. Sigma Nu is a wonderful group of young men. Blake thought so highly of the guys in the fraternity. He told me, this fraternity will help me become a better man. They did a lot of service projects and Blake was involved with those projects, his mother said. Cruz said that the family stays in contact with KSB investigators. We talk to Detective Mark Carter probably every other, every other week. The Kentucky State Police have been great, she said. We are constantly praying that answers come to the police or that someone steps up so that we can close this chapter. Unfortunately, that's it for the press. There's a few other articles, but they're repeating the same stuff that we've already touched on. Once again, if this case has grabbed at your heart like it's grabbed at mine, please spend a little time listening to True Crime Cast's episode of Unsolved Blake Cruz 
couple of additional pieces of information you're going to find in there. Some things I kind of wove into today's episode, some things I didn't. So it will certainly be worth your time. And quite honestly, I really like the approach that these hosts took with this story. And they did some footwork. They reached out to detectives. They have some, some other pieces. So please check that out. There is a Facebook page that I found for, it's really it's for honoring Blake. It's not necessarily a page for you to come and talk about, Hey, I've got this theory. What about this? I think this might've happened. This is really for people to share memories of Blake, people that knew him directly. And here, um, I hope they pick this back up. I don't know if they have, but we could see in 2019 that they had a memorial golf scramble put on by his fraternity, uh, just as another way to remember Blake and to honor his memory. Um, also some special messages here from family members about how, you know, gummy bears were one of Blake's favorite things and just uh, some real special stuff here. So if, if you're looking to get a little more connected to the story, that's another place where you can do it. There is a Reddit thread on it, not very deep, just a few comments on the case. Um, I think we'll probably have a little bit more of a meaningful discussion in the comments down below here. Uh, as always, I ask that we please remain respectful. I'm almost certain that Blake's family is going to see this video. So let's make sure the comments are on point about being helpful, being respectful. It's okay. We could talk about theories. We can, we can do that kind of stuff, but please always keep in mind that do it as if you were talking in the room with his mother and father present because there's very likely going to be a moment where they are going to be present in, in those comments. So uh, let's please do that with respect. I will include the links to um, Blake's Twitter account as well. I did find a Justice for Blake Cruz account. Looks like it was fired up just almost as, hey, we need to get his poster out there. It's only tweeted twice. It's got nothing for followers yet. You know, maybe if you want to show the family a little support, do like I did, just click that follow button. Let's just have that number start ticking up and let them know that, hey, there's people ready for, for more information to come through this. Now, I wanted to do something special in terms of a donation. They did run a GoFundMe for a little while, but it's been since shut down. I can't even find, I found a link to where it was, but GoFundMe doesn't have it officially listed on the page anymore. So I really thought about, um, kind of what was Blake's dream? What did he want to do? And I found this nonprofit organization called drumsfordrummers.org. Carl Stewart's Drums for Drummers is a nonprofit corporation established to place donated drum sets into underfunded schools with music programs. We help drumming students get access to a drum set. Drum kits are placed into junior high, high schools, and after school organizations in underfunded school districts with music programs. They also have this special condition that I think is kind of cool. You don't have to be in band to have access to those donated drum sets. They want to make sure that if you've got an inkling for drumming, there's a set that you can go and, and try it on and learn more about it on. Uh, I thought that that was just a little way that we can kind of connect with Blake's spirit and maybe help push that forward back into the universe in a way that I'm pretty sure he would have done if he was here himself. So on behalf of my amazing supporters, thank you guys so much. Uh, I've already made a donation to drumsfordrummers.org. I'll have a link to them down below. If you want to increase that, make your own donation, you can do that super easy. They have a donate link right through PayPal. And once again, they're nonprofit, so you could turn it into a little tax deduction if you want. Um, to Blake's family, uh, I know I saw the interview with Blake's mother and the fact that even the news coverage, just hearing about this instance and having his name connected to something like this come up again can just be painful in itself. I really hope that you see that we've tried to be as delicate and respectful as we can to the conversation, but as complete as we could with the information. Uh, and please know that this is an effort to keep that exposure raised. That shouldn't be on your guys's backs. Uh, it, you know, I, I want to be part of your team rolling forward to help. If there's anything else I could do for you guys, please feel free to reach out to me directly. You can email me at john at lordandarts.com and uh, we'll do everything we can to, to help you 
and to keep exposure raised to this case. I don't want it to trail off like we saw with the news coverage. Everything just kind of shut down, you know, around 2018, 2019. Yeah, we had some things that everyone had to focus on. The world's focus shifted at that point. How about it's time that we break off a little of that attention, get it going back on this case, and see if we can help this family out. I hope you guys will do that for me. First of all, hitting that like button does help this video get seen by more people. So if, if, that's, if that's the least you could do, please just take a moment and hit that like button. Outside of that, just give it a little thought. Do you have friends or family members that live in this area? Maybe acquaintances, people you connect with on business? Please share this video with them. Let's make sure that we get more people thinking and talking about this case. I think that's going to be part of what needs to happen. It's, it's a big social component that we're looking at right now. So we need people to be aware, talking, and maybe someone heard a little something and they just haven't put it together. Maybe they don't know the name of the victim, something along those lines. This video could make that difference. So take a moment and please con consider sharing it with people, uh, particularly in Kentucky. Before I end today's video, I want to thank several new patrons. Thank you so much, Tawny Lee. Thank you, Amanda Day Satnavage. And thank you, Susie Summers. I know who you are, Susie. Looking forward to seeing you at CrimeCon next year. Um, also, a big thank you to Unsolved VA for increasing their pledge. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even buy us coffee like Candy Bishop recently did. We can't do this without your support. We've been trying to help multiple families in these terrible situations for, it's going to be seven years at the start of February at this point. Thank you guys so much for helping me do this. I can't do it without your help. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Arts channel.